everyone. Welcome to an interview with the Codex Station. I am your host, Sonny Kruger, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Dan Kelly. And today our very special guest is Patrick Hickey Jr. He is the founder of ReviewFix.com of Legacy Comics, and he's the writer of the Minds Behind the Game series, The Job, Conjury, Brooklyn Bleeds, Dem Goals, and plenty of other things. And before we had a one shot, and now today is the full interview. Thank you for joining us, Patrick. Yeah, man. Happy to be here. Thank you guys so much for uh, for having me. Our pleasure. All right. So today we got quite a bit of questions. I was coming up with quite a few. Dan was coming up with quite a few. So I'll just get us started right off the bat. And you. my first question for you is to just say, Patrick, since you're working on many comic books, tell us about your most recent project. Uh, right now, um, we're, we're a quarterly company. Um, we come out with comics winter, spring, summer, and fall. And we usually come out with about four four to five um, books a season. So right now, we have a prequel to uh, one of our flagship series, Conjury, um, that's being worked on right now. We have a Ashcan um, in the job series that we're working on. We also have a creator-owned project um, in the works. Yes, the job. Oh. Nice. Such a fun, such a fun story behind that. Like, if you guys ask me later, I'll I'll give you the rundown. Um, then we're also doing. Um, I'm not sure if you guys saw, but like we got a write up yesterday for at a Canadian newspaper. Um, because we're doing a a comic based on a film that this Canadian production company is doing. Um, called the Odds Makers. So it's like if you grew up with video games like Hitman, you will totally dig this comic. Um, we're having so much fun putting that together so those are like four projects that we're working on right now and i'm i'm super excited because it's four different artists um i'm scripting one book i'm editing another and then i'm writing another two so it's just like growing up brian michael bendis was like a big like inspiration to me he was writing like two or three or four series at the same time like james tinney and the fourth is doing stuff like that now so for me to be able to you know have my hands on multiple pro multiple projects it's like a writer's dream come true so yeah, I would say sound sound a bit busy. Yeah, you know, take on a just, just, quite just a few things at the same yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, and I know you do have a podcast as well. Yeah, you seems you got plenty of things going on. It's yeah. always oh. something different with you, but yeah, it's always good to hear. And Dan, I know you had a, a question about Patrick's most recent um, project in there. Oh yeah, the one that you you mentioned, the one, the odds makers. I, I read it's being filmed, a short film that's being made in this town called Cochrane that's in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. I want to know you being from New York, how did you hook up with the the producers, the husband and wife that are producing this film to make a short comic based on it? I used to run uh, drugs uh, through Toledo into uh, Toronto. Um, no, social media. It, oh, nice. Oh yeah, social media. Social media is amazing. Of, uh, wasn't that basically the plot of the first season of The Good Girls? <laughs> basically, you know, but um, it, it just listen. It's um, I am uh, I have been called by my worst enemies and my best friends the same word, um, tenacious, and um, I push my products on social media all day, every day, can't stop, won't stop, and um, I try and instill that same type of uh, you know, desire in my team, and uh, it so happened that. One of my artists, Chris Booth, um, who did Young Conjury with me. He did Door Slash with me. He's a super talented artist. Um, he's in charge of admissions at the Terry Knickerbocker School of Acting, which is a pretty prestigious acting school in New York City. Um, and when he came out with his first comic with us, he was doing the rounds on social media. Like, he was busting his ass on social media, trying to get as many people as possible. And uh, Timothy Gerges, his friend from Canada, hits us up and... I felt so bad um, because, you know, to ship to Canada costs like 25 bucks, you know, like from New York. So this guy bought like the Renfield ash can that we did, which is based off of like 200 year old um, unpublished notes from Bram Stoker that we got from Bram Stoker's family. Freaking crazy. He wanted that and he wanted Young Condry. So he was basically buying like $11 worth of comics and paying $36. So I felt terrible. So I threw in a whole bunch of other like fun stuff in there for him. And um, I hit him up with like a text on uh, Instagram and I was just like, hope you get everything, you know, really sorry about how much the shipping costs is like nothing I could do about it. And then we just started a relationship talking. He's a 49ers fan. Um, we started talking football and stuff like that. And then it's just like, I'm producing a film. You think you guys could do a comic? And I was like, well, we just did a comic for a wrestling documentary. We're in the middle of doing a comic for an off-Broadway play. 
um, we just did that Bram Stoker project. We could totally do something. And we just started talking. And um, it was so funny because um, he he read Renfield and he loved Steve Conjay's art on it. And he was like, that's the guy I want. And I was like, well, that's the guy I was going to suggest because I think he could do a great job. Because Steve draws amazing looking cars. So and obviously, like, if you're going to do like a hitman, he's going to have like a sexy car and stuff like that. So it was just a match made out of heaven. Um, Right before the podcast started, I got like page four. So it's going to be like a 10 page um comic and uh I'm, we're, we're penciling we're penciling and inking as we're you know as we're going on right now so like we're, we're like pretty much halfway done with the project and it's, it's coming along awesome but the short answer to that is just social media and just being on top of stuff so we've we've only been a company for about two years but we've we've shipped to like the philippines china germany um spain like we we ship worldwide we've we've we're starting to build an audience so it feels really good so the comic, is that something that you're going to release or yourself, or is it something you're going to do and give to them and they're going to like release it in a package with the, with the movie? It's going to be a little bit of both. Um, so it's a little bit more than a uh, work for hire for us because my whole thing is like, I saw like, they, they showed me the script of the film before they even started filming. And I got to have a really nice long conversation right. with the director of cinematography to kind of get like an idea of like what they wanted out of it. And, um, it was so funny. The director of cinematography is like, you ever see the movie Haywire with Gina Carano? And I'm like, I reviewed that film like 15 years ago. Like I was on the red carpet of that film. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I've been a journalist for 20 years. Like I, I've reviewed hundreds of films. And he's like, holy crap. I'm like, if that's the type of comic book you want to make, we could totally do that. And this was like kind of before like any contracts were signed or anything. So um, when I was drafting up the contract, I immediately put in there that like we wanted copies for ourselves like for the store and stuff because we saw like the this is gonna be a really good comic book so like i didn't want it to be um just like a one-off that they would get you know and so we're gonna actually um distribute like copies for for us like for us as a company but then we're gonna actually house the digital copy of the book on our site for purchase as well so that's how much faith we have like in this uh in this thing so it's a little bit more than a work for hire i would even go as far as like it's like 2001, uh, a space, 2001, a space odyssey, like when Marvel did it. And like when Marvel yeah. was doing the star Wars books, like they, they take like some ownership and some Liberty with the story and, and stuff like that. So like, we have a lot of faith in like what Tim and that team is doing with that film right now. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Man. So one question is speaking of comic books, what are some comic books that inspired you? Ooh, there's so many. Um, I'm like looking all over the walls right now. Like uh, I'm looking at like, how like Howard Shaken? Um, I'm looking at Spectacular Spider-Man. I'm looking at like Eric Larson. I'm looking at um, Kazar. I'm looking at Commandy. Um, what else? What else? Deathlock, Darkhawk, Sleepwalker, Ghost Rider. You know, like um, lots of '80s and '90s books. I would say, in terms of like writers, uh, Frank Miller, huge, huge impact on me. Jim Starlin, huge, huge impact on me. Um, yeah, man. Um, Batman in the 80s, that Frank Miller badass stuff, the Daredevil Frank Miller stuff, the Brian Michael Bendis oh, yeah. Daredevil stuff, the Ed Brubaker Captain America stuff. Like, oh, I like really like tough guy macho comics, you know, like noir type stuff, like really ballsy, tough nice. characters, you know. So, yeah. So yeah, that's cool. that's kind of like the short end of it. But like, two, I'm a literature. I I taught I've taught literature for 17 years. So I'm a college mm -hmm. professor. I'm a full time college professor. That's my full time job. And um, there's a ton of like Dumas in my writing. I love like the Three Musketeers. I love mm -hmm. like Count of Monte Cristo. Like I love that sense of adventure and stuff. I love films like Highlander. You know, like to say you would like I, this, uh, you would like this series that I just did a review of. I don't know if you heard of it. Seven Swords by Aftershock. Nice. It's all these nice. um it's all these literary characters that have to get together and it's um but it's um D'Artagnan and uh I'm trying to remember all of them. um uh D'Artagnan, Cyrano de Bergerac, Captain Blood, Le Maupin. Oh. And they all, Don Juan, and they all have to get together to fart to fart to, fart, to fight <laughs> Cardinal Richelieu. I know I like it. I like it when they farted them better. Yeah. I think that'd be the better story. <laughs> That's awesome. No, yeah, I love it. 
so I love like bringing bridging that gap between like something that's like because like when I grew up, '90s comics were so much fun. Like we're talking Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, yeah. um, Bobby Liefeld, um, Jim Valentino, Will Spertaccio, all those image guys. But then like the Cuberts and stuff like that. But those comics, I mean, didn't have like great great stories 80s comics had great stories chris claremont stuff you know like um for you talking daredevil he, born again yeah. Steve Engelhart, frank miller yeah jim yeah. shooter you know so it's just like i i like to think that legacy is really like kind of a way of like combining really fun 90s art with like really solid storytelling that like we haven't really gotten in comic books i mean as much as i love james tinney in the fourth like i read the deviant uh number three the other day i literally read it in like seven minutes i'm like this is supposed to be like the best writer in comics right now. Like the guy that's moving like the most books and there's not a lot of writing here, you know? So it's just like, I like to, even when we do an ash can, like a eight, 10, 12 page ash can, that there's a significant amount of writing for people to like really grasp on to the characters and embrace like organic storytelling. There's no pandering and things like that. So, so yeah. And speaking of, I heard when you did say dark Hawk, I have to ask, do you have dark Hawk one? It's it's actually right. It's actually right there. Oh, I see it's it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right no, there you go. So you can retire. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, you got so. a retirement plan on the on the wall there. The value the the value of that comic is like it's so this and that like all the time depending on who you talk to you know. So I bought it for twenty dollars. Um, I was at lunch break in, in graduate school in like two thousand eleven, and um, I was in a really shitty mood, and um, I'm just like, hmm. I wonder if they have Dark Hawk number one. And they didn't. It was 20 bucks right in the long box. I'm like, thank you. Made the rest of my day. You know, and yeah. I've just held on to it, held on to it ever since. You know, yeah. so it's all and it's all because of the action figure. Yeah, when it came out there, everyone was thinking it was gonna be in like he was gonna be in Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Yeah, because they released that Guardians of the Galaxy line of Marvel Legends, and there was a Dark Hawk figure, and everyone's like, Dark Hawk's gonna be in the movie, and they're like, No, there's like, you know, we just had to throw in an extra character too to fill out yeah. the line and then and he's got such a cool it. design too you oh, know yeah. why yeah. wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want an action figure of dark walk you know yeah. like so yeah. hell yeah all right man we were speaking comic books one of my questions for you also is i saw your daughter has a comic book so what is the story behind your daughter writing her very first comic book uh, my daughter is six going on 46 <laughs> she's <laughs> whoo man she um she listens to like every conversation that I have on the phone. So it's just like, she knows like um, what printers I prefer to work with. She knows what like letter letterers I prefer to work with. She knows which artists take too long. She, like, she knows everything. So I call her like my chief cuteness officer, you know? Um, but what happened was we just moved into a new home and we moved probably like a half hour away from where we're, where we were living and to a little kid. I mean, that's, yeah. That's life changing. You know, so um she was like super lonely and super bored and um I was working on some stuff and she asked me what I was doing and I told her that I was writing. She was like, You think that I could write a comic? And I remember I got a piece of paper and I folded it in half and I wrote like one, two, three, four, five, six. I was like, Here's six pages. To see if you can write a story in six pages. And she's like, Oh, that's not enough space. I'm like, see what you can do. And she ended up plotting this story about wanting to be uh, a big sister and uh, the whole process of being like an only child to being a big sister and like the anticipation of waiting for like her brother to be born. And now her brother's her best friend. So it's, 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 it's real life. It's, it's, right. it's her story, you know? And um, I was just super shocked because she reads incredibly well and she's an excellent writer for her age. But I was just like, I can like, she was like Rob Liefeld on this. I was like, I could totally Chad Bauer, her i could script over this and add some dialogue and like she this story totally makes sense has a point a point b and point c so um it was originally going to be her christmas present i got like one of our best artists uh joshua adams who did sarita with us he did dem goals he did godfo um he did a whole bunch of great stuff with us and um he's a religious guy and uh he's done a lot of crazy projects for us like just because he's awesome and he was just like this is like something that i could show you know like my friends and family this isn't like you know the other stuff that you've had me do that's like a little bit more out there and stuff so he was totally down and it was going to be her christmas present 
and she's cause since she's like right behind me all the time i'm like on the pre-order page like you know trying to work it on social media and stuff like that and she's like oh my god you actually made my comic <laughs> oh my god so um we ended up you know showing it to her and it sold incredibly well like i'm super proud of her like i, I i'm ragging on some of my team members that have like books that haven't sold very well like the last like four months i'm like how is this little girl outselling you you know and they're like look at her look at her she's adorable of course her <laughs> book is selling da, 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 da. so but um she didn't know but she signed a contract with us <laughs> as a i saw the post yeah <laughs> Yeah, man, as a four hire, like, you know, so she makes the same amount of money as all of my writers. We opened up a bank account for her and stuff like that. I'm taking her to New York Comic Con with me. She's going to have a little part of the table so she could sign. So, but it just started with, uh, she wanted to just connect with me a little bit more. And she was lonely because, you know, all of her friends were, you know, in another city, you know. So um, that's how it started. And now now she's already like planning another one. She's super funny. So um, it's it's been a lot of fun. And it, it worked because, we didn't have a kid's book, you know, and oh. she's six. Now you got it. Yeah. Wow. It's like a kind of like the kid that did Axe Cop, but real life instead of, yeah, instead of Axe Cop. Uh huh. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. So yeah, it's well, available now. check it out. Here's the, uh, yeah, there's the uh, website. Yeah. And the story is my brother and the ladybug. So it is available to mm -hmm. buy now. Check it out. Yeah, and the, the cool part is um, the last three pages of the book are in black and white, and they can be colored. Oh, um, nice. And we have a variant cover that um, is in black and white that you can color as well. So we've had so many little kids that like um, have never like experienced comics read the story and then take out their markers and start drawing on it. So like for me, it's about having something at the table that is accessible to little kids. Um, cause I feel like we have stuff for young adults. We have stuff for adults. We have stuff for women. We have stuff for men. Like we have something like if people like noir, if people like superheroes, if people like pro wrestling, if people like, um, like Ren and Stimpy, if people like zombies, we have like something pretty much for everyone. So this like just checked off like such a huge box for us. And it, it's been like one of our best comics, like sales wise in the past, like four months. So I'm super proud of my daughter, super proud of Josh. Um, it's just been it's been fun to to do this with her and and watch her get like super hyped about it, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, man. And Dan, any more questions? I know you have quite a few. I don't want to keep going on. And I'll let you get to some of your questions. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um. I was gonna say, I, you know, I know that when you were on the one shot, you talked about starting the you know starting the comic company, um, Legacy Comics, um, with your partner, and then you you know bought it outright. And you run it, but. I was just kind of interested in a little more of the nuts and bolts of starting it. Not, not making the, you know, it's one thing to make the decision like, you know, Oh, I'm doing this comp, this comic for this other company. I, I could do this. I've got experience in it. Like, you know, everybody always has the idea. I can do this. I can do that. But uh, like I said, I'm a little more interested, you know, or was kind of interested in hearing about what it took to go through and like, okay, you know, you've got to, like you said, like you got to make up contracts, you got to find talent, you got to get that. Like you have to, you know, how did you go through finding a printer, um, you know, setting up distribution, uh, you know, just all those things that that go into like it's one thing to write and draw a comic, but then to like actually publish it is a whole other beast. Whew. Like you, you nailed it. Um, it's so much. But the thing is, too, I, I think the thing that really um, helped me. The most is that I've written seven books on video game history before I got into the comic book industry. Um, so, like, looking at the way the publishing company that I've worked for for, like, seven years does business and their distribution model and the way they handle contracts and the way they handle payments really prepared me to be in charge of a comic book company. Um, hiring artists is incredibly difficult because I, I'm literally hunting all the time on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. And um, especially like when you run an indie comic book company, a lot of artists um, want a page rate that um, will bankrupt most indie companies. Yeah. You know, they'll be like, Oh, I want a hundred dollars a page for pencils, inks and colors. And you're like, well, if you at if you were at Marvel or DC or image, they would totally pay that because they're going to print 30,000 copies. And they're going to print those copies for like four cents each, five cents each. And they can afford to pay that for you because in order for them to break even on this project, they only have to sell a certain amount of, they only have to sell like 500 copies. So they would be totally down to do that. 
um, you're talking when you get into the indie comic book area, you're talking print runs of 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000, you know, and um, your print costs are significantly more expensive. Um, yeah. You've got to find you've got to find the right printer. So it's just like um, one of the reasons why I decided to start the, to do the company by myself is because um, I was prepared to do all of those things. But since I was co-owner, I was only getting to do like half of them. And my co-owner was like learning on the fly and um, wasn't learning fast enough. And I was I ended up having to do a lot of this stuff by myself. You know, it's just like it's one thing to like prepare somebody to go into a important meeting with a licensee um, because you've done it before, like myself. And then it's another thing sitting in the room and like waiting for them to talk because they're not saying anything because they don't know what to say and you're taking over. So it just, it got to the point where it was just like, if I'm going to be the guy, I might as well just be the guy, you know? Um, So that was hard, you know, like um, John and I had like a really good relationship leading, leading up to that, but it just got to the point where I was just like, I would say there was like a good month before, um, before, you know, we parted ways that like, I felt like the company was not bottoming out. We've never bottomed out, but where we were just going flat and I like hockey sticks. So I want to do, I want to do this. I don't want to stay steady. You know, I'm like, if we're having a week where we're not moving like a lot of books on, on the site, I want to, I want to bring in, uh, uh, another ad partner or I want to sign another artist or I want to write something like I want to keep the ball moving every day, every week, you know, and um, that's hard. Like if, you, if you're somebody that's working alongside somebody like that and you have to keep going all the time, a lot of people can't keep up. So there was like resentment and, you know, like between us and stuff. And it was just like, it's just better to, it's just better to move like while the company is like still young and um, the hardest part was like telling the team after it happened, you know, cause they, they didn't, they had, they had no idea. Um, but then when I told the team, they were like one, 1000% recept- receptive and they were like, yo, let's go. And um, I think it was the best decision that we made as a company. It forced me to learn how to letter comic books which, oh my God, is so much fun. Like I'm actually like probably like one of the only people in the world that like actually enjoys lettering comics Um, because like I'm not an artist. I can't draw at all. So it's just like lettering is like my way of like controlling the story and stuff like that. So it's just so, it's so much fun. But like to answer your question, it's just like I had all of this experience from publishing prior and like I've been a journalist for 20 years. So I've dealt with publishers of all different shapes and sizes. And then um, I've, I've been super lucky. Like I've been a voice actor in video games for about six years now. And uh, one of the companies that I work for mega cat studios um, has been super, super helpful throughout this entire process. Like they would take me, like I spoke at PAX East and PAX West last year and the year before that. And like, you know, we, they would pay for me to come out and talk about video games and stuff. And they would go, who's your printer. And I would go so-and-so and they would go, no, you need to talk to this guy. And I, oh, okay. And then when I come back from like, you know, Chicago or DC or Seattle, whatever I call. And so we have the same printer as, as Skybound, you know, like, yeah. And, um, we, we pay, like, we have a great agreement with them. They do, they, they've helped us tremendously. So it's just like being the head of a company, it's, you have to know people, you know, and you have to be able to like put your face out there and stuff. And I just felt like I was the only person at that time that was really like, willing to do that stuff. Um, so it just made sense for me to like take over the company. But like to, to answer your question, just like um, I've got 20 years experience, 20 calendar years basically as a journalist. I've got seven published books. I'm a video game voice actor. I know a ton of people. So when we went to Kickstarter, that's what I did too. I like people like, how did you guys get funded in three hours? How did you end up getting 300% funded? And I'm like, we could have been 400% funded, but when people saw that we were going to get funded, what happens? You get canceled pledges and stuff like that. Cause people like, yeah. Shit, now I have to, now I have to pay. But, um, it was on, it was on my back. Like if this company, like I told my wife when I left uh, lesser known comics, if this Kickstarter doesn't succeed, I'm done with comics because I'm never going to, um, mix good money with bad money to quote my buddy, double J Jeff Jarrett. Like, you know, you don't, 
you don't mix good money with bad money, you know? So just yeah. like I make a six figure salary as a college professor, I pay my bills and stuff, but it's just like, I mean, you guys know this, you're in comics. It's like all the hashtags comics broke me and people with like thousands of copies of their own books, like that they're never going to sell and stuff like that. Like, that's not me. Every person that's written for me has been paid what they've been con contractually obligated to be paid. I don't know the printer any money. We have money to print books for the next year. Like we're in a good spot and it's just by running smart business. Do we, do I want to move more books? Oh my God. Yes. Do I want to print more books? Yes. But like, I, I don't, I'm not hurt because of the comic book industry and I never will be in a situation like to be hurt. So I just feel like, if I was running the company with somebody else, there's there's a possibility that like we wouldn't be as as solid as we are right now. And I couldn't allow that to happen because writing comics by yourself or drawing comics by yourself is is an insular experience. But there's like I have like eight or nine people on the payroll that like get a royalty check from me once every three months. And if I'm not busting my ass to like push their books and they're only getting a royalty check of like twenty five dollars, why are they doing this? Yeah. You know, so I just. I like that level of accountability and some people don't. So it's just like, you've got to be like a special person. It's like the drummer in a, in a metal band, the goalie on a hockey team, the catcher on a baseball team. Like these, you all, you have to be a special person to do that. You have to be hardwired in a certain way. And um, I just feel like being a creator is one thing, but then running a production company and running a publishing company, you have to be wired a different way. And I feel like I am. So. Nice. So speaking of all that work you do is like it's the comics looking for more people to join the team always always but the thing is it's just like um i mean real talk and as you guys can tell like i'm pretty candid i i speak you know the truth as often as possible well, not as often all the time like i'm i just say it the way that it is it's i get i get scripts sent to me um i would probably say i get anywhere between like five and ten scripts a week um and I ended up publishing my daughter before them. So that kind of goes to you, like the quality of most of the scripts that I get. Um, but the thing is, it's like I tell people all the time, like I don't want to be um, a studio. I want to be a publishing company. So it's like I don't want somebody to send me a script and be like, I want you to find me an artist. I want you to find me an inker. I want you to find me a letterer. Because the thing is, it took me like four years to put together the team that I put together to finally do like Conjury and the job. So. I feel like if you're if you're just writing, then you're you're it's like comics. You have to be a you have to be on the ground floor of the entire thing. And if you just like give your script to a company and you allow them to put together the project, it's losing something. Like if you go out and you find the exact artist that you want, if you find the exact anchor, the exact letter, the exact the project, the project is going to come out so much differently. So like I would much rather have um, somebody come to me with a completed like eight page ash can and be like, this is what we can do rather yeah, than a lot somebody of going, do that. Yeah. So yeah, that's what image does. That's what dark horse does, you know? Um, Cause that's kind of like when you see what somebody is really made of, if you make it too easy for somebody, then, you know, then they're going to give you a script and be like, well, what are you doing for me? You know? And it's like, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to be a studio. I would rather be a publisher. That's not to say that I wouldn't read a great script and go, oh my God, I have an artist for you because it's happened. It's happened several times since we started the company. But the thing is like, I feel like um, if you're in it on the ground floor, when it comes out, you know that your work isn't finished. I find like a lot of creatives, a lot of writers, a lot of artists and comics feel like their work is done once the book comes out. And it's like, it's not, you got to move the book. You know, if you don't move the book, you don't get to make another one, you know? And it's like, I have so many writers go, oh, I just gave you the first eight pages, but like the story really picks up like around issue like 11 or 12. And I'm just <laughs> like, bro, people aren't, people aren't going to yeah. first. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like you got to, it's got to be all killer, no filler. How do you know we're even going to get to 12? I'm, I still cannot believe that like I have enough Condry stuff to do an omnibus. You know, like we have like eight issues between like the spinoffs and stuff. And I'm just like, that's like a dream. Like I'm going to put together like my first trade paperback, you know? Um, but bottom line is like if we were in like Conjury three and Conjury four and we weren't at least breaking even, I would have killed, I would have killed the character myself. Like I would have got the knife and killed the character myself because bottom line is like 
I've had so many people in comics tell me like the first five years that you're doing this, you're just trying to break even. So this way you can print more stuff. This way you can build a library, give people an opportunity to like get into you. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. But it's like, if I went out and sold like five copies of a comic, guess what? They ain't gonna, there's not going to be another number one or another, another, another number two. I'm going to keep pushing this one to make sure that like, may, or maybe it's not good enough. And see, that's the thing too. A lot of writers, you know, it's so easy now to make a comic, to write a comic, the, all of the, there, there's so many programs out there. Like there are people that literally like can't draw and are using like poser and stuff like that. And it's just like so many people are making comics, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be, yeah. you know, there's so much noise out there. It's so hard to get your stuff noticed. And it's just like, so short answer. Yes. We're always looking for people, but we're looking for the right people. And um, I would, I'm much, I'm much more comfortable with um, teams that are already put together that I can kind of see the way they work, who are the strong people, who are the weak people and stuff. Um, I love writer artists. There's not a lot of them anymore, but um, we we're going to publish someone, um, uh, Rianne Myers in a couple of months. She's doing like, she's doing an amazing like uh, comic so, but she's a writer, artist. She pencils, inks, colors, letters. Like she is a like legit badass. She's a one man, one woman band, you know? So it's like, those are kind of like the people that we're looking for. Um, so yeah. Cool. Dan, I'll pass it to you to ask another question you have. Uh, well, you mentioned the video game books that you, you know, kind of pivot from the comics for a minute. So, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned the video game books when I looked on your uh, website, not the legacy comics, but, you know, the other website you, you said doesn't get updated. Um, you know, I saw you had a lot of these there. So I was just wondering what got you interested in writing this series of books about all these different video games. I know there's like, you know, one about first person shooters and, um, you know, and, and all of these, you know, each book about these different genres. So I, I've been um, a journalist for about 20 years. Um, I'm a former NBC editor. I've covered three Super Bowls, two um, Olympic Games, a presidential election. I interviewed Paul Walker like two weeks before he passed away. Like um, I've done, I, I uh, covered Whitney Houston's death. I interviewed Philip Seymour Hoffman. Like I've interviewed dozens of professional wrestlers, politicians, singers, songwriters. Like I love covering entertainment. I covered uh, professional hockey um, for 10 years. And, um, but it got to the point, like right before my daughter, uh, was born where I'm like 33 mm -hmm. and I'm like, I've never written a book yet. That's a problem, you know? Um, and I was sitting like in my, in like, kind of like this room in my old home. And I'm like, I need to write a book. I need to write a book, have it done before my daughter is born. Because I know when my daughter is born, I'm probably not going to be able to be as productive because I'm, I'm a dad. I'm going to have to be a dad. Um, and I'm just surrounded by video games. So I just start picking out video games. I picked out like six. Um, like Boy and His Blob, Yars Revenge, um, Mutant League Football, King's Bounty, Wonder Boy and Monster World. Like just games that like I grew up playing that I loved. And I'm like, if I can get like half of these guys that created this, these games to agree to interviews with me, I think I'll have enough to pitch to a publisher for kind of like, um, I'm a big ESPN, like 30 for 30 guy. I love those yeah, documentaries right. Oh, all day. I could just sit down and watch them all day, you know, or like the, when the history channel does something like they had, they had a comic book one, like 15 years ago that I love. They had another one on Dracula that I loved, you know? So I'm like, there's not a lot of video game books out there that, are about the people that made the games. So I started pitching and it's so funny because this was like Halloween of like 2016. So within a week, all six of the people that I pitched got back to me and said, yes. So I was wow. like, Oh my yeah. Yeah. It was insane. Like we're talking the guy that created pitfall, David crane emails me back like two days later. And he's like, yo, yeah, I'll definitely talk to you. Um, Howard Scott Warshaw, who made Yars Revenge and ET on the Atari 2600. He's like, Yeah, I'll talk to you. No problem. Blah, blah, blah. So now we're talking. Um, this is Halloween 2016. By Thanksgiving 2016, I had written those six chapters, done the interviews, and my wife was drunk on tryptophan. You guys know if you eat turkey, it makes <laughs> yeah. you tired. So my wife's like six months pregnant, and we had some turkey for Thanksgiving, and she's sound asleep on the couch. So 
I got these chapters written. I'm super happy with them. So I just start sending pitches to publishers. And um, one of them was McFarland and Company. And um, they answered me back like it was like Thursday. It was Thanksgiving. So three days later, they were like, yo, let's do business. And um, they signed me to a one book deal, which was the minds behind the games. And then I was going to do a big ass sequel. And they said, no. And I was like, why? What's up? And they're like, because I sent them like 25 chapters. And they're like, um, you have like enough for like three different books here. You have enough for like a shooter book. You have enough for a sports book. And you have enough for adventure books. So they ended up signing me to a three book deal, which was great. Wow. And then after the second book in the three book deal, I was like, yo, since we did like adventure sports and shooter, why don't we do like Sega Genesis, PlayStation and PlayStation 2? And so they're like, oh, my God. So they signed me to another three book deal. So we're talking since 2016. Uh, I started them in 2016. So 2018, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So seven books in seven years published. Um, and these are these are beefy books. These are interviews with the developers, and they're not Q and As. They're me going in as a journalist, doing like a ton of research on the game, the historical background on the game. So like we're talking Mortal Kombat. We're like I'm listening to like Senate. Uh, United States Senate and Congress grand grand uh, testimony about why video games are you know violent and things like that and all this crazy stuff and putting that in the book and then interviewing the developers the people that made the game so um, those were so much fun to write those like really like flexed my journalism muscles and like I'm the head of the journalism program at my college so um, I was assistant director at that time but by the time the seventh book came out I was director of the program because it was just like I was doing it and writing these books um put me in a situation to become a voice actor because right after the first book came out i had game developers messaging me that were like oh can you take a look at this game like tell us what you think blah blah blah. and um wow. i ended up e ending uh editing dialogue on on a game uh called the padre which eventually came out on like nintendo switch playstation 4 um xbox and stuff and what happened was i edited all the dialogue in the game and then the voice actor left like right before the Kickstarter and they didn't have a voice actor. So I ended up auditioning knowing that I had basically written at, or edited all of this character's dialogue. I felt like I was coming in with like a really heavy hand. And um, when I, when I auditioned, they were like, absolutely. And then that just opened, that just opened the door where people were calling me to do trailers for games and things like that. So uh, in the past, like six years, I've done like 25 between I've done voiceover for about 25 games. So it's been wow. it's been a lot of fun. But I leverage all of those yeah. all of those opportunities into the comics. Like for instance, like we just did a comic for an off Broadway play, and um, we got a billboard in Times Square for a month out of it. It was crazy. Um, the actor that was in the play, I interviewed him like 15 years ago. So he was just like, I I I didn't know that you were doing a comic book. Like, I didn't know that you owned a comic book company. What? Why don't you do a comic book on my play? You know, and so it's to the point where it's like. The people on my team are like, Pat, like, you're just doing things like completely different than most indie comic book places do. And it's just because I'm built different. You know, it's like I have this back, this background in journalism and stuff. So it's like, why not use that? So, yeah. So you did all these books on video games. You've got to love video games. What's your, what's your, what type of games do you like the most or what, what's your all time favorite game? Ooh, that's so hard. Um, I would say like if I'm alone. I probably want to play like Fallout 3 or like Fallout New Vegas or Fallout 4 or like Diablo or Diablo 3. Like I just like to play stuff that like takes me on like an adventure. Um, Pokemon, the original Pokemon games. Oh my God. And it's like, it's funny because like, hold on, I'll show you guys really quick. My readers, like they follow the hell out of me. So like they know that I love the Game Boy. So... I had a reader send me a Condry oh, game wow. There's That's awesome. You know? Um, and the thing is, like, no batteries. You know, it charges itself. It's got a backlight and stuff like that. And then when I was in Chicago this year for um, the video game summit, um, somebody gave me a Kroom. They made me a Kroom oh, one. Nice. You know, and it's got, the, it's got the Legacy logo in the back and stuff. So it's just like, um, I love the Game Boy, you know? So, um, 
So to answer your question, probably like if you if I was like on a desert island, I would probably take this bad boy right here with like Pokemon Red or Pokemon Blue and start like a brand new game and just wait for somebody to to, you know, the new Pokemon games are fun. But it's just like I love I love the old school stuff. Like it's even like, you know, WWE 2K24 and stuff like all those games are cool. But like I'm looking right now and I have like a virtual pro wrestling for a Nintendo 64, the Japanese version, you know? So it's just like a really good old school wrestling game. I could play that game for hours. So I used to play the WWF one for Nintendo. So that game was not the easiest one. Yeah, no, it wasn't. But like pro wrestling on the NES, that's like one of the greatest wrestling games of all time. You know, like the, the one that's like a winner is you, you know, like it's, it's, it's one of the greatest wrestling games of all time. And uh, one of the founding fathers on that game went to go create um, Fire Pro Wrestling. So if you know anything about wrestling games, Fire Pro is like, that's, it's one of the most beloved wrestling franchises of all time. So getting geeky now, see? See what happens? <laughs> um, and the thing right, is, uh, Bernie, what's your favorite video game? Me? Yeah. Ooh, it might be uh, either, well, lately I've been playing a lot of UFC games, but Metal Gear nice. Solid, Grand Theft nice. Auto. And then I'd be picking those Pokemon. Games. So you guys are all picking newer games. If I had to pick my favorite game, I'd probably say like Mega Man Two. Oh, nice! Oh, yeah, nice. Always fun. Yeah, much better than Mega Man One, which was way too difficult. And that cover. Let's not talk about the cover of Mega yeah. Man One. <laughs> and since we were talking about games, I was going to ask you, and then too, how we were talking about you know your voiceover work. I was going to say, what was it like doing voiceover work for WrestleQuest? Oh my god. So the way that all worked out is um I love to talk, as you guys can tell already. Um and I get emails from people like feeling me out a little bit, like every day. You know, like, oh, what do you guys do? How can I help? Blah blah blah. And I remember um I found this company based out of Pittsburgh, um, called Mega Cat Studios, and they were making and they still do make new Sega Genesis and Nintendo games. Oh. They make new ones. And they they get all these homebrew developers and stuff and like they made a garbage pail kids game last year. Like they make such cool stuff. Like I have a whole bunch of their stuff like right over here, you know? Um I love them. So what happened was I reached out to them and um I ended up getting in contact with like their CEO and um we just started shooting the shit and um it was basically like he was building his company and I was building my entertainment website, reviewfix.com. Um, and he was asking like, you know, how to write a press release. And then like, we were just bouncing ideas back and forth and talking and he has amazing contacts and he knows amazing people and I know amazing people. So we, we would always just like kind of help each other out. If he needed something that I could help him out and I, I would do, if I could do something to help him out, I would and things like that. And then what happened was I did the Padre, like I told you guys, and James was like, you do voiceover? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, hmm. Um, so then like COVID happened and um, I had pitched him a job video game. That's a long story. That's a fun story. But I pitched him a job video game and I showed him the whole level design. And uh, they were like, this is a pretty ambitious project. Um, let's see how you do on something else. So they, they put me on a role playing game and um, I wrote probably like 15 uh, side quests in a role playing game that they're they're still working on, um, and I loved working with them. So then it's just like, oh well, and this is like four years ago. They're like, we got um, this wrestling RPG, and I'm like salivating like Homer Simpson seeing a donut, you know. And they're like, can you do? Um, you think you could do some voices for it? And I'm like, sure. What like what do you need? And um, they're like, we have a lot of like unlicensed characters. So, like, we would have you, like, just make up, like, what they would sound like and things like that. They're like, but um, the main character in the game is uh, the macho man Randy Savage. Nice. And I was, like, I was like, oh. And he's like, what? I'm like, oh, yeah, let me tell you something. Yeah, can you dig it? And he's like, yes. <laughs> yes. Got it. And, um, Snap and then, it to a Slim Jim. Snap it to a Slim Jim. Oh, yeah. You know, and... um. He's like, oh, and we got Legion of Doom. And I'm like, oh, what a rush. You know, and he's like, yes. And it just it just kept going and going and going. And um, that's so much fun 
working on that game, but it was such a long, it was like a four year, three and a half, four year development cycle. Mm -hmm. And I went to PAX East twice with them. I went to MAGFest with them. Like we traveled all over the country and they traveled, they traveled all over the world, those guys. Um, so when it was finally like released, it was like a, it was like a load off of my shoulders. Um, and then right away they're like, Oh, you want to, you want to do voices for the Renfield video game? And I was like, okay. And I didn't even know that I got it. And I, I voice Nicholas Cage in that game, you know, wow. I, That's yeah. And awesome. I voiced Nicholas, Nicholas Holt in that game. So it was just like, they've, they've opened some amazing opportunities for me. Um, voice acting, voice acting and comic book writing um, are two things that everyone thinks that they can do. There's so many people that are like, oh, I could do voices, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, okay, I'm sure you could do the voice. Are you prepared to do it 50 times in a row? That's what they get people, yeah. And then it's after easy. that, it's like, can you get that? Can you get that today? Can you stop everything that you're doing and do it today? You know, there were times like when I was like in another part of the country taking my mic and stuff with me and recording audio like in a hotel room before I would go downstairs to speak at a panel and stuff like that. And those are some of those are for like jobs I didn't even get, you know? So it's, um, it's really, it's a rough business. But the thing is though, too, it's just like, it prepares you. Like this is why I try and tell my students all the time. Like the skills that you learn are always transferable. You know, if you're the type of person that you consistently make deadline, that you have a lot of energy, that you have a lot of passion, whether it's voice acting, whether it's writing books about video game history, whether it's comic books, if you have passion, it carries over to all of those things, you know? So I, I'm, I've been really lucky that the people that I've worked with in publishing have helped me in comic books and the people that have helped me in journalism have helped me in comic books and the people that have helped me in voice acting have helped me in comic books and the the former students like i'm looking at my kickstarter and i'm just seeing pledges and i'm like that was a student from like 14 years ago that was a student from like nine years ago like so it's just like you may not know it but like you're building an army like every single day you know yeah. and the thing is it's like you got to just activate them and the thing is like with voice acting um, it's hard. It's one of those things because you're you're by yourself. Like if I had to make voice acting like a sport, it would be like golf. You know, it's like golf. You're you're by yourself. It's yeah. it's you. If you if you screw up, it's it's on you. You you could blame the caddy. You could blame the wind. But it's like at the end of the day, it's on you. And voice acting is the same exact way. You know. And and that being said, it's not for everyone. Everyone thinks that they could go in a world one man one tortilla rated PG thirteen. And then it's like. All right, now do it for two hours. Now go on Twitch. I mean, when WrestleQuest first came out, I was on Twitch, and they they made a rig for me. So it's just like when I moved around, all you saw was Randy um, Muchacho Man Santos, like the main character that's like modeled after the, the Macho Man. That's like a Macho Man like protege. So it's just like they had me in the corner of the screen, and whenever I moved, the animation moved, and they were like, Pat, listen, we need you to talk like him the entire time. So I'd be like, yeah, tonight we're on Twitch. Yeah, we're doing the stream. Yeah, can you dig it? For like three hours to the point where like I would leave like the garage from streaming and just be like, I was oh. gonna say your voice gotta be messed up if that. <laughs> and my wife would be like, How did it go? And I'm like, like talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, like I'm doing okay, like sign I, language. I felt like I felt like echo, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I haven't done voice acting. I've done recording for, you know, bands I've been in, like, you know, going out and recording the vocals. And yeah, you go in and it's like you record a line, like, oh, I could do that better and record it again and again and again. And you just keep like recording, you know, recording the same stanza over and over again at the end. You're like, and especially if you're doing heavier music, you're like, oh man, at the end of it, like, I'm not going to be able to talk tomorrow. Yep. And then I'm a college professor. So that's all I do. Yeah. You know? So it's rough, but like to answer your question, like um, it prepared me. It prepared me for so many other things, and I and I've met so many amazing people doing it. Um, it's definitely like a skill set because I I have become like a like almost like a brand ambassador in a way for the game. Like you know, we were on G four. Um, oh, cool. You know, like we you know, and I was I was interviewed for that. You know, I was on Chris Van Vliet's show, like. 
at, on on the rig, you know, like, and that was nice. the thing that was crazy too. Like, um, I was the character the entire time, you know. So it's just like, it's pretty wild. It was it it's been it's been fun. Yeah, and speaking of the game, before we move on to another subject, uh, I think mm-hmm. you know, as somebody who reads the job, I think the job would be a great game—a mixture of bank robberies and wrestling. So. I, I totally it saw, saw it as like a retro game, like the original Grand Theft Auto meets like an old school like NES or Super Nintendo wrestling game. That's the way I originally yeah. saw it, you know, and um, I wrote the design document. It's on my computer. So it's just like nothing is um, nothing's out of, uh, you know, anything could happen. Like I, I also like there's a there's a video game company in Europe that contacted me last year about doing a Conjury on video game like a beat em up and they designed sprites and backgrounds they made music for me and all this stuff so that's something that's like very much a possibility so right. that would be it's awesome. a lot of fun up, yeah. yeah man oh yeah i could totally see conjury is like double like kind of like a double dragon type game like super fun just walking around beating the crap out of people and stuff like that so it could be fun yeah i would definitely love playing those games i think they would be awesome yeah hell yeah so I, I wanted to ask too you've mentioned you know yeah, how you're a teacher. I saw that you are get this right, a full-time assistant professor of communications and performing arts and the director of the journalism program at the Kingsborough Community College. And you're also the chairman of the City University of New York Journalism Council. That seems like a lot. And then you've got the voice work and you've got the comic work and then doing the, you know, you know, not just running the comic company, but you know, producing the comics and writing the books. Like, how do you you know, how do you find time to balance your, you know, if you want to call it like your, your day job, you know, the adult stuff and like all of the side stuff, how do you, how do you balance doing all that and finding time to, you know, to devote to everything? To be fair, like, um, I don't really hang out to be honest, you know, like, um, I have people all the time. Oh, you want to go to Dave and Buster's tomorrow? You know, you want to go bowling? And I'm just kind of like, eh, you know it's like i'd rather make my own game than play another one right yeah, yeah i'm ta- i'm telling ta- it's crazy because it's like i've been really hungry to read to read some other stuff the last like couple of weeks but i'm just like it co- you come to the point where it's like do you want to make your own stuff do you want to make your own stuff or do you want to support somebody else and sometimes people that will that don't know that you exist people that will never support you you know um but to answer your question it's just like so I- i've had to make sacrifices um uh, for one, I'm straight edge, so um, the CM Punk people will know. Like I've 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 never drank, I've never smoked in my entire life, um, so I've never been like a party guy, you know, ever. So um, I I enjoy creating. I have friends that like get that that like will be like, oh, I'm outside your house, like let's go walk for like an hour or 45 minutes, and we'll just BS and stuff like that. Or somebody that like will go. Um, you free and we'll end up talking two hours on the phone about like new comics and new video games and stuff like that. So I have friends that really like get that. Um, my wife totally gets that. Um, my kids totally get that. I always make time for them, but see, this is the thing too. It's just like, um, when you're a college professor, like I work, I only work like two, three days a week. I'm a full-time college professor and I only work like three days a week. So it's like, it gives you the time because like, that's the thing, like as an educator, if you're not growing as an educator, like if you're not writing something like every couple of years, if you're not adding to like the zeitgeist, like if you're not adding to like the amount of knowledge that's out there, how can you teach people? You know, and that was one of the reasons why I wrote my first book, because like I remember like a couple of weeks before I had a student to ask me, like, how do I go about publishing a book? And I hated not being able to answer that student's question. I was just like, that sucks. You know, and I was only 33 at the time, you know. But I was like, that's a problem that needs to be <laughs> fixed. So to answer your question, like I am, I'm pretty on top of time management. Um, I don't waste a lot of, a lot of time. Um, I can get by on five hours of sleep, four or five hours of sleep. You know, um, I walk a lot. Um, I walk like anywhere from like 15,000 to 20,000 steps a day, like take care of myself. Um, I don't eat as good as I should, but like, I still like, you know, um, so I take care of myself as much as I can physically, as much as myself, uh, emotionally, you know? And then I, again, look, I mean, like just looking around this room, I got a lot of cool stuff. So like, if I'm ever in a bad mood, I just plop on the couch, play a game for a little while, unwind, 
you know? So it's just like, I don't have a reason to be in a bad mood. You know, I have two wonderful kids. I have a wife that I'm going to be married to for 10 years this year that I love just as much as I did when I first started going out with her. So it's just like, I just use all of that as fuel and just try and create and, and move that snowball every day. So it's just like to answer your question, it's just the things that are important. Like that's, that's what I handle. It's like, I remember when WrestleQuest came out, Oh, that we had a, we had a bunch of bugs in the game when it was first released. Every video game has bugs, you know? And I was getting messages on Facebook from people. Oh, you know, like in the second level of the game, like there's a game crashing bug and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, bro, I just did voices on the game. <laughs> and they're like, well, aren't you going to tell them? And I'm like, no. And they're like, why? And I'm like, cause I just did voiceover on the game. <laughs> That's all I can control, you know? So it's just like when – if you, if I'm if I'm scripting a story for another comic book company, I'm going to do my best to – and I've never missed a deadline in my entire life creatively. So it's like I'm going to script the hell out of that book. I'm going to get it to you on deadline. I'm going to give you the best that I possibly can. And that's it. I don't want to hear – like I don't want to talk to the publisher about his wife, I, about his wife and kids. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about that. You ask me a script, I'm going to script, I'm going to do the best job that I could, and then I'm going to move on. Because, like, I need time for, like, my wife, my kids, the couple of friends that I have. So it's just, like, it's just, like, constant time management. It's just, like, I can even smell it. If I'm on the phone with somebody and they're just, like, eh, and the conversation is about to go, like, in a totally other direction for, like, another hour, I'm, like, yeah, I got to go. I don't have – and they're, like, oh, can't can't do it, not doing it, you know, so – and you it's gotta, hard. It, you got to do this, be like, you know, do the uh, – what. What you know? If your kid's name is John, be like, what? What is it, John? John, don't touch it. John. I I gotta go and hang up. I, and it's and the you, best excuse ever. Like I'll just go. Oh, like, my wife's on the other line. You know, well, yeah, no, wife's on the other line. I gotta what go. What do you want? Nothing. I was I was just using you as an excuse to get off the phone. Yep. And it's just like, <laughs> what you got to manage the most important things. So it's just like I think I've been I think I've been good at that because I I'm, I can juggle a whole bunch of things at once because I know what's important and what's not. So. so if we hear any of you guys saying like, "Hey, my kid," I'm gonna know. I'm like, "No, no. <laughs> you're, you're stuck here." The excuse you told me. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. I've done that before. The like, conversation, I'm like, like, man, it's been 45 minutes, man. I, I want to get off the phone. I'm just like, but no, don't touch it. Don't touch. It. Shit, I gotta go. Sorry. So I'm just like, woo. All right, man. Let me, let me go. Back. Yeah, I, it's like one of the best reasons to have kids. You know, it's yeah. like. <laughs> All right. Well, Patrick, you know, as we were talking before, like you've done plenty of interviews and you've interviewed all kinds of people, like you said, wrestlers, politicians, actors, all kinds of things. So out of everything, what has been the craziest interview you've had? I think you guys will appreciate this one big time. Um, I produced an interview, uh, meaning I helped my, my journalist. Cause like I told you guys, I own an entertainment website, reviewfix.com. And, um, I produced an interview, so like I helped, I helped the journalist get the interview. I, I was the cameraman for the interview. I edited the interview and stuff like that. I didn't actually conduct the interview. I helped them come up with the questions and stuff. But um, we got to interview Chris Claremont at his house. Wow! And this is like 2010. Awesome. Oh, and um, we were in his backyard, and there was like, I kid you not, easily like 300 mosquitoes in his backyard. And we're just getting we're getting destroyed. So then he's he's just like, yeah, we need to go inside. <sighs> go in Chris Claremont's house. Stacks of comics. Stacks of black and whites, 11 by 17s. And we're talking. We are talking Cockrum. We are talking John Byrne. We are talking Jim Lee. Like this guy. I was like my, it was like a Looney Tunes. Like my mouse was on, on the floor. And I'm just like, if I die right now, <laughs> I'll be okay. Like, I'll be okay with that. But like all, all, all jokes aside, um, during that interview, cause like at that point we're talking, this is like 2009, 2010. Um, I had written Conjury in 2002 when I was 18 and uh, 18, 19, 2001, 2002. But like at this point, 2002, I was focusing solely on journalism. And I haven't, I, I, I hadn't found an artist for Conjury yet. So Conjury was like a pipe dream. Like one day, maybe I'll publish a comic, 
you know, and I had interviewed like David Mack and my Michael Oming and s- some great comic book writers. So it's just like the dream was still like one day to publish a comic, but it wasn't realized yet. So like I'm in Chris Claremont's house and I know who this guy is and I know how special he is and stuff. And the, the journalist is asking questions about like Wolverine, Cyclops and Colossus. And um, Chris Claremont never says Wolverine. He never says Cyclops and he never says Colossus when he answers the questions. Oh, is he calling Logan, Scott, Peter? And Peter, yeah. Oh, wow. And I'm just listening and I'm just like, this guy is fucking weird. Like, what? And then it hit me where I'm like, the reason why those comics still read so well today is because to Chris Claremont, those people were real in, yeah. in his head. Yeah, and to me, that's. Head. Yeah, man. And I'm like, that's what great comic book writing is. It's like even I mean, if Kevin Smith is no Chris Claremont, but Daredevil Guardian Devil. Yeah, when when Mysterio starts to like vent at the end and tell the story about being sick and stuff like that feels like a real person, you know, when Karen Page is going through all the stuff, you know, and she you know, I don't want to give it away to people that haven't read it, but like, you know, when she, when, when she meets her maker, so to speak, it's like, that feels real. And to me, it's just like, that's what great comic book writing is all about. So it's just like to be in the presence of Chris Claremont and hear him talk about that. It's just like, it's something that like, I remember after that interview, I went home and I just like totally tightened up like the first like eight issues of Condry, just because I was like, this dialogue sucks. Like this needs to be this needs to be better. And then I started reading like Eric Powell, like the goon. Um, and I started reading resident alien from Peter Hogan and stuff like that. And those guys are like masters of great dialogue. You know, they really bring characters alive, but like to answer your question, like that was one of the craziest interviews that I, I was ever like privy to, to be in the same room. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, find, I tell people too, you know, from, you know, for writing too, as, um, one thing that's always helped me is to tell them like it'll it'll look good. It might look good written on the page. Read it out loud and then hear out sounds because once you read it out loud, it might look good, you know, sound good in your head, you know, when you're just reading it there. But when you hear it out loud, you be like, oh, that does sound awkward, and especially for dialogue because mm-hmm. you hear it like that's not you know like you got to get how people talk. Yeah, absolutely, and especially too, you know what it is? It's like with men. Writing female characters have to be super careful, yeah. you know. And then if you're if you're writing characters that are of like different cultural, you know, um, if they look different than you, if they they if they cook different than you, you know, all of those things you have to think about those things when you're when you're writing dialogue. And like I help out with a lot of indie other indie publishers and stuff, and and you know they'll send me comics before they're published, and I was just like, um did so-and-so write this? And they'll go, yeah. And they're like, why? I'm like, cause that sounds like something they would say, not the person, not, not the character yeah. that they're writing, you know? So, and it's like, we, we live in a, a weird time now with comics. Like there's way too many out there. And a lot of people are writing comics based off of like, you know, like themselves, they're putting themselves in, in the, in the comic book. And it's different. Like when, when a six year old girl is doing it, that's one thing. But like when a 45 year old man is doing it, like, like, where's the skill? Where's the precision? You know, like create a world, you yeah. know, like build a world, you know? So, so yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you gotta write it. So every character, like you could put yourself into it. Like I'm putting myself as this character. Okay. Well, that's only one character in the book. You can't be every character. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you, oh, gotta, yeah. you know, you, you know, every character has to have their own distinct voice. Absolutely. Like even too, like I let's say for instance, me, I love eighties hair metal. It wouldn't be realistic, realistic if every single character in my stories like that. I mean, I can make some, but everybody, it's okay. Well, I mean, unless you're writing a Steel Panther comic, yeah, <laughs> maybe <laughs> that would be a fun one. It's like you know you're doing something right. Where like I'll give you an example. Like Conjury Five came out a couple of months ago, and we introduced uh, another character, um, Father Watkins, and he's this priest that just like er- he curses like ridiculously he's this like really grumpy irish priest that just like every other word out of his mouth is like the f word and um because he's just sick and tired of like new york city just being dilapidated by crime 
and he's just like he's over it you know um he believes in god he's a man of the he's a man of the cloth but he loves to curse and um i've i got so many emails from people that are like oh my god like that character like i know a priest like that you know or like um sarita she's an elderly african-american woman in our comics and they're like yo i know a sarita and i'm just like that's that's how you know like you're kind of like hitting people the right way when they can latch on to a character that's completely different from them or might remind them of somebody else but a lot of people don't try and and do that a lot a lot of comic book writers would be so much better off if they were more comic book readers first you know so any more questions dan um no i think i'm good well i was you know you, you talked about interviewing claremont um uh and you know i know you've you know, interviewed a lot of actors and wrestlers and musicians. Who would you say is the is the favorite person you've had over the years that you've done an interview with? Ooh, it's hard. Um, Dave Gibbons was a really fun interview. Oh, I interviewed yeah, him that's... twice. Super, super nice guy. Kevin Eastman, another super, super fun guy. Jeff Loeb, oh my God, like freaking genius. Joe Casada. Lots of fun to interview. I interviewed Axel Alonso before. These are just comic book people. Um, but I mean, I, I'll go back like it probably like two interviews that like really stuck out the most with me. Um, I'm not sure how oh, you guys were in bands and stuff. Um, Don Felder. Do you guys know who Don Felder? Oh, is? yeah, yeah. He so, just I mean, played he at looked... um, the, the Ravens game the other day. He played at the halftime. He's, I mean, it's one of the, the most influential guitar players of all time. I mean, he wrote. Hotel he wrote California. To, he wrote the intro to Hotel California. That whole guitar intro is him. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was a great that was a great interview. Had a lot of fun interviewing him. Um, Channing Tatum was a lot of fun, just because uh, my wife went nuts. My wife was like, <laughs> "Oh my god, what was it like to be in the same room as him?" And I'm just like, "Yo, listen, I totally typecasted him. I thought he was gonna be like, you know, and." He is just like super freaking smart. Um, super smart. But um, let's see. Paul Walker, I was shocked interviewing Paul Walker because like um, it was for this movie called The Hours. You guys should totally check it out. Um, it's about um, his wife gives birth and then um, then get they get stuck in the middle of like uh, Hurricane Katrina. And she ends up, his wife ends up dying because the power goes out, like, right after she gives birth. Right. And um, New Orleans is being, like, raided by, like, looters and stuff. And he has this baby who's on, like, a ventilator that, like, is, like, battery operated. And he's trying to, like, get it to charge. And he's running around, like, flooded New Orleans. It's not, like, a movie that Paul Walker would, like, ever, like, everyone thinks, like, you know, Skulls and, like, uh, Fast and the Furious. This was, like, a real movie, you know? this was like a legit movie and he was fantastic in it and um doing the interview with him he was so hopeful of the future of being in more movies than just like the fast and the furious and he was super down to earth i mean we ended up talking for like an hour and a half he was just a super nice guy and um i was really cool with his publicist um his publicist um used to represent the guy that played abraham in the walking dead so i got to okay. interview that guy too so i remember when he died i was working at nbc and I immediately called his publicist and I was like, is it true? Cause TMZ was already reporting it, you know? And they're like, yeah, it's true, but we're not, um, we're not confirming it yet. So I couldn't write anything yeah. yet. Um, but it was just crazy because it was just like, I just spoke to this guy. Like I literally just spoke to this guy, you know? And, um, I remember pitching the, the interview to NBC and NBC was like, nah, we're good. Like, we don't want it if it's not like Fast and the Furious related. So I ended up publishing it on Review, Review Fix and we got a ton of traffic. And then when he died, NBC was like, yeah, we need that audio. We need to publish that like right now. Blah, blah, blah. So they ended up taking it anyway, which was great. But um, yeah, I would say an interview that like really stuck with me is that Paul Walker interview because it's just like, wow, to see somebody cut down like right before they were about to like, you know, yeah. blow up into something, you know? Um, I interviewed the ultimate warrior probably like a month before he passed away too. And it was just like, that was creepy because like, he just gave this, this like amazing speech on Monday night raw and he died later that day, Yeah, you know? 
And he was, I mean, you talk about like passion and like tenacity. Oh my God. Like that guy, like that wasn't a gimmick. He was like, he was scary intense. You know, the way he'd, I'd love the way he'd run to the ring and was pulling on the ropes. Yeah. I mean, he changed yeah, his man. name to Warrior. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yep. There was a, there was a so, cool Paul Walker movie called Running Scared that I remember. I think I have it on DVD still yeah, somewhere. Uh huh. That was I thought you were going to talk about the Ultimate Warrior comic book. And I was like, oh, yeah. do you yeah, guys I remember that? I have, yeah, I have the. I have the first issue of it, yeah. The art is badass. The writing is a little all over the place, but you know, it definitely looks like an image comic from like the early nineties, you know, like you know, it's got yeah. But then there was that whole, got, like, that whole conspiracy theory about they how they brought new ultimate warrior back, but it was a different guy and Meanwhile he just wasn't on roids anymore, you know. Yeah. So uh huh. Some people thought it was Kerry Von Eric and stuff like that, and oh my god, crazy, crazy stuff, man. But yeah, that's those are probably like the handful of of interviews that have really like had an impact on me as a as a journalist. Cool. And me as a writer, my story dead is my first one, so that one always has a special place with me. But for you, it seems that Contra is your first story that you've been, or at least a story you've been working on for many years, that seems to have a special place in your heart. So for Contra, how? long do you think it will go on for or do you plan and hope for it to continue on for issues so, wise so we just published um issue five and then we're doing an ash can spin-off um but like the job i'm not sure if you know this but the job takes place in the same universe as Condry. um so the job was initially planned as like a six issue miniseries and then i was gonna like kind of cultivate those characters and have them live more in Condry, I have like the first 12 issues of Condry um, written already. I would love to like, um, when I think of like comic book series that have like transcended like generation stuff, like the fact that Eric Larson is still doing Savage Dragon to me is just like, that's his life's work. work. And like, for me, that's kind of like, because like Todd McFarlane doesn't do Spawn anymore. I hate to say it. He hasn't done Spawn for a long time. It's his character, but he doesn't do it. Like Eric Larson pencils, inks, writes, colors, like the whole nine yards. And so my whole thing is like, I would love to get to like, we're probably going to do a, and you guys are going to hear it first. We're probably going to do a Conjury, uh trade paperback this year. Um, so that was like a huge, a huge goal of mine to accomplish. But like, I would definitely, I, I have ideas up the wazoo door slash, which we published for Halloween, which is about a serial killer that uses um, DoorDash and like Grubhub to kill people. Um, he's in the Conjury universe as well. So I'm trying to build out like, like the rogues gallery and that. So like, I'm all about like, I want to build a, build a fun like world. So um, the plan is to do Conjury for as long as people want to read it. The second that like, if we do a print run of like 500 and I only sell 20, I can't do another book. Yeah. You know, like, so it's just about, it's about moving books. So like right now, um, Condry and the job are doing really well for us. We're, we're able to like get really close to like selling out our, um, our run, um, our runs of them. So for the time being, those are hot. Those are what we're going to go with. And then, um, I definitely, like I said, want to bring in, um, new creators so they could create and see what works, but it's just like, it's hard. It is freaking super hard to run a comic book company. Cause you have somebody you'll sign them. They'll make deadline. You'll spend hours upon hours marketing the book on social media. And then it comes out and it's like crickets and you sell like 10 copies. And then the artist or the writer is like, well, what happened? And it's just like, it's comic books. That's what happened. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, yeah. you know, and then sometimes on a whim, you release a book digitally and you get like 300 pre-orders and you're like, oh my God, like what just happened here? People actually like this or people like the person that did that. That's why I try and explain to people all the time especially in indie comics, people are buying you, you know? So if they don't know anything about you and you're not putting yourself out there enough, they're not going to buy anything from you, you know? So it's like Robbie Liefeld's podcast. He's got like the number one comic book podcast right now. He did the Thundercats cover. They just got 174,000 pre-orders for that cover. And the thing is, it's like when Robbie Liefeld was doing comics in the 90s, early 90s, 174,000 copies, that would be a good number. It wouldn't be a great number. Today, though, today it's a great number because people don't read comic books like the way that they used to back in the day. There's no, there, there aren't books that are selling millions of copies unless you're talking about books that have like incentive covers that comic book stores are buying copies to like go down into the garage just because they want that $500 Keanu Reeves cover, you know? So, so yeah, it's, 
it's freaking hard. It's it's hard. But yeah, I'm super excited for the future of Condry and uh and the job and Brooklyn Bleeds. I have so much like I'm trying to find the right artist for that book, but it's just like I totally believe in the story because it's like zombie books have been done over and over again, but a zombie book from the point of view of the animals during a zombie apocalypse, written by the animals during a zombie apocalypse, like a dog would write a book, like hungry, thirsty, scared. Like it has this visceral feel to it, all in black and white. Like I just feel like limitless potential. It's just I haven't found the right artist for it yet. So th those are like my three babies moving moving forward. Well, good luck to you and good luck to, you know, with all your stories and we look forward to reading them, collecting them, and them to, to our large collection of comic books. And Thanks, man. Yeah. So before I let everybody go, I will say, Patrick, if now is the time if you want to tell everybody where they can find you and find your work and how they can help you out. Sure, man. Uh, I'm Google verified. If you just write in Patrick Hickey Jr. on Google, my, my picture comes up on the side, all of my... Websites come up and stuff, but legacycomics.com forward slash shop. That's um, the best way to support us. So we have like right now, like 28 physical books. We've got like 76 um, digital offerings. We also have something that's really cool. We have QR comics. So they look like trading cards from like the 1980s. They look like those baseball cards you used to get with bubble gum in the package, like brown craft paper. They're really good quality trading cards. And it's the cover of the comic in the front. You spin it to the back. There's a QR code. You scan the QR code. The comic will open up in super high resolution on your phone. You can read right. it. So those are a lot of fun. You can take those with you. You can get those CGC graded and still scan them. You know, so it's just like, I love slabbing books that i know i'm never going to read again but then once you slab it you can never read it again and for me i'm like i'm about reading you know that's why i write because i want people to read me of, of course we want people to collect them and stuff like that but at the same time those cards are really cool so legacycomics.com forward slash shop we've got literally something for everyone we've got zombies we've got noir we've got a kid's book we've got literally something for everyone so if you guys can check us out Thank you. And Dan, thank you for being my co-host today. You can let everybody know where they can find you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> ah, excuse me. Uh, as I say, you can find me on uh, Instagram here at Dan Kelly Art. You know, give the spiel. I post a few times a week. Um, you go check it out. Give me a follow. Uh, buy a commission so that your money may become my money and that I can use that money to then buy more comic books. And don't forget to uh There's a little Dan Kelly art for you right there. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh yeah, that's the uh I did sketch covers for all the uh codexers for uh Christmas, and that's the one I did for Sunday where uh drew him as the Punisher. Nice, I love it. And uh you can check us out online at thecodexstation.com. Uh it's got links to all of our socials. You can go in there, meet the team members, you can buy some merch from us too, and uh you know, go on there and leave us some messages and you know. Let us know which one of the hosts you like most. Maybe, maybe him. <laughs> but they do get hopefully me. But it's cool if they still like you. At least, at least it's somebody, right? At least somebody Codex. But yeah, like like Dan just said, check us out. You know, at the Codex Station, and then me, Sonny Kruger. I'm also on Google. If you type in just Sonny Kruger, it should lead it should lead you to a lot of my stuff. And you can find my stories on Wattpad, and my username is Son of the Writer. But, yes, today we are with the Codex Station. And once again, thank you, Patrick Hickey Jr., for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Make sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And we will be back on the Codex Station with more interviews, more shows, so many more things. And feel free to always send us your know, recommendations of stuff, people you'd like to see us interview, comics you'd like to see us review, everything. The Codex Station continues to grow. So once again... I'm Sonny Kruger, joined by my co-host Dan Kelly, and today our special guest was Patrick Hickey Jr. So everyone, take care, and have a good night. Ooh, yeah! <laughs>